Hi, I'm Christopher Walker with Closely Observed Teaching. Today is Friday the 13th, 2019, and the Conservative Party have just won the general election with a rather large majority. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is going to happen next and what I think that will mean for EFL teachers, mostly in Europe, but also around the world. Now, what follows could turn out to be completely wrong. It could then be out of date as well, even if it's right at the moment. And uh, yeah, this is a developing situation. So um, everything that I'm going to be saying really is quite subjective, but it is reasonably informed. So if you're an EFL teacher and you're concerned by what's going on, or if you're thinking of becoming an EFL teacher, then maybe this video will at least um, give you something to think about. So let's take a look. What does the result of this year's general election mean for EFL teachers? So Boris Johnson has his working majority and that means that he can now bring back his Brexit deal. It means that Brexit is pretty much inevitable. All of the parties that were either hoping to end Brexit or at least push it back to a second referendum um, were defeated quite resoundingly in the general election. Uh, the Conservative Party um, can now move forward with the uh, Boris Johnson Brexit agreement. So um, it kind of reduces the threat of a no deal exit, at least in the short term. But there is a possibility that the um, the transition period could come to an end without a deal being made and that could then lead to the same sort of thing uh, that the UK might crash out of the EU without an agreed um, trade plan or any of the other political framework that's necessary within Brexit. Uh, one of the key dates that's coming up quite soon uh, will be, well, Parliament's going to be busy in the next uh, month or two trying to push through all of the paperwork to enact this plan. There's a lot to get through. One thing that uh, the agreement uh, doesn't really vouch for is this possibility of the, um, the transition period ending without um, there being a, a declaration or an agreement on uh, the future relationship between the EU and the UK. Uh, Parliament might move to put in legislation that would mean that if it doesn't look like there's going to be an agreement by July of next year, um, that Boris Johnson would have to request one. But with such a large majority in Parliament, it's hard to see how that might happen. So a lot really does rest on what happens in the next couple of months in terms of the development of the um, agreements between the EU and the UK. Uh, now this is going to be all very difficult for EFL teachers because of the timing. Um, when we, if, we, if we do manage to get an agreement with the EU for the future trading relationship sorted in the transition period, well, the transition period comes to an end at the end of 2020, which means that you're a few months into that new school year, the 2020 to 21 uh, school year. So that means people might have come across to, for example, Poland during um, the transition period, maybe joining in uh, September or October of 2020 as EU citizens, kind of. Well, not really, because we'd be out of the EU, but we'd have the transition period to smooth things over and then suddenly find in January that um, well a lot of that kind of support is gone so it can cause some problems there so uh, let's go into the nuts and bolts and make some predictions on what's likely to come up so let's take the example of somebody who decides that they want to try uh, teaching English as a foreign language. They haven't uh, really tried EFL before, so they want to come and do that. Well, um, a lot of people in that sort of position might be fresh-ish, fresh-ish out of university. Now, in the next um, year or two, not much is going to change in that regard. But in the long term, I should imagine that university fees might go up a little bit. Uh, the Conservative Party is not really one to bring down student tuition fees. And since a lot of students uh, at university were voting for uh, Labour or voting against the idea of Brexit, uh, there's no real incentive for the Conservatives to kind of target that area. 
certainly in the general election campaign, the Conservative manifesto focused a lot more on what they wanted to do on policing and NHS. Uh, there was a lot less uh, talk of uh, changes to education and I can't remember hearing anything about university tuition fees coming down. So for people coming into EFL, uh, the problem I suppose will be that uh, people leaving university thinking about this as a career will be wondering how to pay back their tuition fees and they might find that the, uh, the pay rates within EFL are not going to be enough to meet the, um, their own financial demands. Now that's not going to be universally true, um, I mean teaching itself has never been a very lucrative business and you're not really in it for the money but for people with a large loan that they need to pay off that could then be a factor to uh, make the decision one way or the other. On the other side of that, uh, thinking about universities, um, in the last few years especially uh, one of the big reasons that a lot of my own students have kind of gone into uh, English and have been pushed forwards with their, with their English studies has been with the prospects in mind of going to a British university. British universities are among the best in the world after all, but they're going to be a little bit harder for students to get into in the future. Um, one thing that I've heard about, but I don't know if it will be confirmed just yet, would be the idea that um, students um, in the EU eventually will be treated as uh, the same as uh, let's say American Chinese uh, students coming from so far afield so they'll be expecting to pay a lot more for their tuition um, but also I think there might be things on the on the back end let's say in terms of health insurance the idea because one of the the driving forces for Brexit was this idea that EU nationals are using uh, the NHS and it's costing us and putting a strain on the service all of this was debunked but none of that mattered really um, so I've heard that some students might find that they have to at least prove that they have enough funds to cover their health insurance contribution for at least one academic year or maybe the duration of their time in university. But as I say, um, that's something that I've only really heard a little bit about. It might not be the case or it might change. So what can we do about that then? Uh, well, there's not much we can do uh, for teachers new to the industry, new to uh, EFL. Um, I think EFL is always going to be a good career option for people who want to see something of the world, but things will be a bit dif more difficult because of Brexit uh, and the changes there. For our own students, there is a possibility that uh, we'll have a decline in interest of um, sort of academic English, the sort of English that they might need if they're going to go to university unless they're very thoroughly committed, which means that uh, we can kind of see possibly a sort of pivoting of the industry towards uh, what people like Jenkins term uh, English as a lingua franca, this ELF form of um, EFL. <laughs> we have so many letters to choose from, huh? Um, so that's more about the idea of uh, helping uh, cross-cultural communication or communication between non-native speakers. Now, if you think about the way a lot of EFL works at the moment, um, you know, you have a native speaker teacher in many cases and they train their non-native speaker students on how to communicate better with other native speakers like the teacher. But that's really not a good reflection of um, a lot of the sort of communication that happens in English in the world. And I think moving forward, English is going to still be just as important globally, but it is going to be more of that sort of global language, especially if, as some people are suggesting, the UK is kind of stepping off the world stage a little bit, you know, losing its powerful position within the EU, trying to go it alone in a world where it's very difficult to go it alone. Even the Americans are finding that it's difficult, uh, even for a country the size of the USA, to go it alone. You need friends in this world. Um, but if I think about my own students, I have a lot of students, or over the past few years I've had students who, for example, uh, they were Polish working for a Polish company that did business with uh, Turkish clients. Uh, the chances of a Polish person learning Turkish are, I suppose, quite slim, just as the chances of a Turkish person learning Polish to a high level are quite slim. But if they both have some English, they can communicate with each other. So this is an area that could be expanded into. Um, 
kind of connected to that, I can imagine that uh, there might be a renewal of interest in uh, business English courses and maybe big uh, business English certificates. Um, so students might start moving away from the more academically minded and uh, academically um, recognized B2 first, C1 advanced, maybe even C2 proficiency to an extent, and more towards the Cambridge uh, BEC or Business English Certificate exams. You might even see a resurgence in things like legal English or maybe the developments of whole new fields. Um, English for marketing and a certificate to go with that. Um, English for medicine, English for um, in international communications and trade. There are lots of areas where ELF can really open doors that at the moment they're not closed but there hasn't been as much of a focus on these things. And I wonder if that might happen in the future. So coming back to our example then of a, a teacher who's thinking of entering AFL, maybe they've left university, maybe they're looking for a career change, maybe they've decided to get out of the education system in the UK uh, because of underfunding or further cuts, who knows? They're, so many possibilities at this stage. Maybe they decide that they want to give EFL a try, so they come over to Poland. What would the working conditions be like for them? How easy would it be to get a job? Um, what would it be like once they're here? Uh, well, we do actually have a kind of pattern to go from here. I think that most people coming from the UK in the future will be treated on an equal footing as their um, American or Canadian counterparts. So the way it works generally is that you need to apply for an employment visa once you've got the job offer. If that's granted, then yeah, you come over here and you can start work, but you're most likely to have to open a uh, company for yourself. Now I have a company for myself. I'm self-employed and I have uh, a company, I have an accountant and I have all of the paperwork that goes with it. I'm quite fortunate in that I have a wife who handles all of that sort of thing so I don't need to worry too much because it can be a little bit intimidating to go into the paperwork. Finding a good accountant here would be important. Um, but what does it mean to be self-employed? I'm going to make another video soon to go into this in more detail. But basically one of the things about being self-employed is that you have um, less of the backup that you would get by virtue of being an EU national. So by that I mean, for example, um, well, first things first, coming over here is very simple if you're from the UK at the moment. You just come over here, uh, you get yourself a job, uh, within the first three months that you're here you register at the town hall and um, now and again you'll get a reminder to update your paperwork. There isn't that much more to it. But when you open a company you'll need to get an accountant, you'll need to choose a company name, uh, you'll need um, to be prepared actually for some of the payments that you'll be making. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first couple of years that you have uh, your own company, you pay a reduced level of national insurance contributions. And in Poland, they're called uh, the, the institution running that is called ZUS. So for the first couple of years, you pay a lower rate of ZUS, and then you pay tax on the remainder of your earnings. So it's usually about 18%. But it's worth noting that that ZUS contribution is flat rate. So it doesn't vary from month to month. If you have a month where half of your time you're off on holiday somewhere, maybe it's the winter break, you still have to pay the full whack uh, Zeus. And after two years of having a company, that Zeus uh, will go up to, at the moment, it's about 1,200 swatting. Uh, the other thing to consider, this is something that Americans need to take care of at the moment, uh, but UK nationals will need to do that in the future as well. They'll need to think about health insurance. At the moment, most teachers travel and teach on the EHIC system. So this is the European Health Insurance Card. It's a reciprocal arrangement that's always been uh, very useful to have. I've never needed to use it myself, but it's a really uh, valuable backup. Um, the idea is that uh, if you have the EHIC card, if you fall sick here or you need to go into hospital for whatever reason, uh, you won't be charged because you have this card and they have a reciprocal arrangement with the UK. So uh, it kind of defers the cost or moves it over to uh, your original country. Um, obviously when we leave the 
uh, EU. For the transition period, I imagine the EHIT card will stay in, in operation. Uh, but after that, it's likely, because freedom of movement is ending, it's very likely that the EHIC will no longer be uh, available to uh, UK nationals. So there will be that to consider as well. Is all of this a problem? Well, that's a, a question um, for people to decide for themselves. Um, I'm happy working as a self-employed teacher here. It gives me a lot of uh, freedom to do other things, such as um, offer proofreading services to companies that are interested in doing that. Uh, a lot of companies, especially here in Poland where you know, uh, bureaucracy is, has always been quite rampant, um, they won't do cash in hand sort of thing. So you can't, if somebody needs proofreading done, they won't say, oh, you know, I'll just you know, put some cash in an envelope and send it to you. They'll want uh, an invoice. And if you can generate an invoice, that opens that uh, area of work for you. Um, to be able to generate an invoice, you need to have a company. You need an accountant who would then file the invoices so that you know how much tax to pay. Um, so a lot of the teachers that come here, um, you know, when they're working just on a, a regular EU contract, uh, they can't do those sort of things. If they get an offer from, um, you know, some local institution to do a training course or something like that where they'd be paid, they'll have to say no unless it can be done through the school because they can't generate an invoice for it. So. Um, there are limits, in a way, uh, to what you can do when you just work as a teacher here, and having your own company can be quite beneficial. So I don't think that's going to be a major problem, but it is going to mean that there are additional hurdles that people have to jump over to be able to come to Poland and other EU countries, I should imagine, if they want to teach English as a foreign language. Uh, I don't think it's going to stop very many people. I think, personally, I think that it might prove almost a good thing in a certain sense because I've always been a little bit wary of people whose first reason for wanting to teach English is to travel. And I love travel as much as anybody else but um, when you think of education you don't really think of free time in the same sentence. I don't think teachers in the UK get a great deal of free time. Teachers here don't get as much free time as they would perhaps like so coming to another country simply to travel and to pay your way by teaching English. Um, I don't think that sort of thing works anymore, not like it did maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So if you need the commitment of um, setting up your own company to come to a place like Poland, maybe that's not a bad thing. So uh, I've looked at some of the, let's say, downsides to um, the fact that Brexit are coming, is coming. Um, there is one slight upside, it's just not an upside for UK nationals and it's an upside for non-native speaker teachers. Uh, there is a growing movement or at least a growing recognition within EFL uh, that you don't have to be a native speaker to be a good teacher. I've been saying this for years but I've been saying that for years simply because I've met some really good teachers who were not native speakers. So I have, ex uh, I have had experience of this sort of thing. On the uh, flip side, I have met native speaker teachers who, whilst being really uh, charismatic or great at establishing rapport with their students and who were determined to get their students to succeed, uh, weren't very well um, grounded in either teaching techniques or in their knowledge of grammar. So I've always thought that the best English teacher is the one who knows how to teach and knows English very well. And I don't think I've ever really thought of it as an exclusive domain just for native speakers. Um, that certainly seems to chime in with what I've been hearing at uh, the conferences that I went to during the summer months. Um, goodness, thinking of the conferences, I hope I don't have to apply for a visa if I just want to go to Slovakia. This uh, <laughs> freedom of movement thing is a real problem. Hopefully, because it's all Schengen, I'll be able to move quite freely around this part of Europe at least. But I suppose we'll have to wait and see. Anyway, going back to my point, um, what we're going to see is uh, a growth in the number of non-native speaker teachers coming into EFL and coming into private schools, perhaps to make up for any possible shortfall in uh, UK nationals. I imagine if there is a shortfall, it could be uh, short term. 
it could be that just on the next intake, for example, EFL teachers from the UK are sufficiently put off because of Brexit that they don't come over in the numbers that they have done before. But then after a while, when the systems are all in place and we know exactly what is expected of people who want to come and work here, maybe those numbers will recover. There are a lot of unknowns, like I said at the beginning of the video. But what it certainly does do is open the door for talented young teachers, or just talented teachers, you don't have to be young, do you? It helps. I'm not young, though. It opens the door for teachers <laughs> who are non-native speakers but committed and want to uh, get into the industry in a big way and get into this sort of teaching. Uh, they can come in with their qualifications and with their experience and they can really make a career for themselves. I think that's wonderful uh, because Coming back to that point I had earlier about English as a lingua franca, the more non-native speaker teachers you have, the more globalised English becomes, the more it is a global language, and the more you can kind of capitalise on the world experiences of people who are not from uh, L1 communities, or L1 English communities to be more specific. So there is that to consider. But there is another point uh, connected to this, and it's one that I made in uh, the IH World Online Conference which is that there might prove to be more competition for places in the future when you look at teachers coming to schools uh, here in Poland and maybe in other places. And what I meant by that when I had this conference and uh, certain people said Brexit wasn't going to happen. Um, I wish I'd have, I had reason to be so optimistic, but unfortunately I'm a natural born pessimist. Uh, one of the, the things that I said then was that uh, if there is any kind of shrinking in uh, EFL, if schools are a little bit more conservative in their hiring practices, they don't want to take risks on a teacher who might not stay for a whole year, then they might start focusing more on building uh, a staff room that is uh, fixed in the longer term. So we generally have, um, I would say that our turnover here is what you would expect really. Uh, teachers stay for a year, two years, three years or the long term and uh, you get movement between those levels. So some people might think to stay a year, others uh, will stay and then they'll see that the school's a very good one to work for and they'll stay longer and then they make this into more of a career. Um, but in the future maybe we'll have fewer of those teachers who are only interested in a year's position they might come over here thinking well I want two or three years at least especially if I'm opening my own company and have to go through all of that rigmarole so there could be competition for limited places within schools and if that's the case those who have the most qualifications as well as experience will be the ones who um, get the best positions who are the ones who do best in uh, the EFL field. So if you've got a CELTA, uh, that's really just enough to get the door open and get you into a school, perhaps. In the future, maybe not. Maybe the CELTA is too um, limited a course. It's just initial teacher training. It's four weeks. I think you do something like six hours of teaching in that time. Well, you'll get days where you teach for six hours here. Um, maybe schools will start expecting you to have or at least to be on the way to um, the next level of uh, qualifications maybe with a short course like the ones that IH World offer um, maybe even um, working towards the Delta within a year or two so these are all some things that people will have to think about for me these are positive developments the idea of getting people trained better uh, with more qualifications to go with uh, their experience in uh, EFL. I think that is good for students, it's good for schools and it's definitely good for the teachers involved. Not everybody wants to make that commitment but it might be that it's necessary. So, just to very quickly summarise, this turned out to be a much longer video than I was planning, almost like some sort of diatribe. Um, it appears now, because of the election results, Brexit is going to happen. I'm sad about that myself because I love the, uh, the freedom of movement, I love the EU, I've always thought of myself as European first, 
British second, and well, that's it, isn't it? It's enough. Um, so that's coming to an end. Freedom of movement is coming to an end, and it's going to change the landscape of EFL. It's going to mean it's going uh, changes in the way that people come over to Poland and to other EU countries, and in the long term, it could have knock-on effects. Uh, we'll have to see what um, the relationship with the EU turns out to be, and then we'll be looking at um, trading relations and political alignment with other countries around the world. Uh, at the moment, for example, to go to Japan, if I remember correctly, you need to have a degree and uh, to be a, a UK passport holder because of the, the trade, uh, sorry, the treaties that we have with Japan through the EU. Of course, when we leave the EU, those treaties kind of come to an end and we need to renegotiate something new. Hopefully, it will just be that we'll copy and paste. So the existing conditions will prevail, but we'll see. Uh, I suppose the message here is there are lots of um, ifs, ands or buts, especially in EFL. There always are. Uh, but EFL remains a really interesting area to go into. It remains the case that if you find a good school, uh, that offers you support, um, then any obstacle can be overcome. And I'm very fortunate uh, that my school is one of those. I work for International House Bielsko Biawa, um, and they are very good at giving support, especially when it's needed, and it will be more needed in the future. So I, I, I can put my trust in them, and I know that they'll be uh, in a position to help people as much as possible if they want to go into EFL. They're also really good at the um, continuous professional development that I underline as one of the most important factors here. So, um, long story short, changes are on the way. Changes in this case tend not to be positive, uh, but there are many things we can do to ameliorate those changes. And being aware of what we need to do and the changing landscape will help us to um, cushion the, the blow of Brexit. So there you go. Uh, if you managed to get through much of this, <laughs> thank you for sticking with me. Um, we'll see how things pan out in the future. If you disagree with my point of view, uh, please put a comment below. I'm very happy to stand corrected. Um, and if I've in any way misled people with this video, I really hope that's not the case. Uh, but if there's anyone out there who wants to contradict me or correct me, please do that. Um, and I'd be happy to, to um, rectify the situation. There we go. All right. I'm going to go back and start teaching. <laughs>